B2B buyers have the right intention, but a lot of times in the 21st century, they're distracted by tweets and by all kinds of online things. Salespeople have a unique set of knowledge when it comes to making decisions about their particular product. A buyer can't know what a salesperson is going to say to them. I'm Sales Nation, I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show, where we help you not just hit your target, but really thrive in sales. If you haven't already, click subscribe, and let's meet today's guest. This is Jeffrey Lipsius. I'm author of Selling to the Point, and my book is about sales training. I specialize in decision coaching skills. In other words, having salespeople help customers make better decisions. On this episode of the show, you're going to learn how to coach your potential customer, your prospect into making a buying decision, how to get them through self-doubt, how to get them through limiting beliefs, how to help them if they're just not self-aware of what's going on in their organization whatsoever, how you can guide them to making a decision, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, they need to make a decision, and you're going to help them make it. So with that said, let's jump right into the show. Today, we're diving into helping coach our customers through decisions, but to just tee this up, and this is clearly subjective, but are B2B buyers, decision makers, are they typically good at buying stuff? Well, they need to be in touch with what they want. What I find is that B2B buyers have the right intention, but a lot of times in the 21st century, they're distracted by tweets and by uh, uh, all kinds of uh, online things that are keeping them from being able to make the best decisions. And that's what I'm doing is showing salespeople the skills to help B2B customers actually develop into better decision makers. And the reason this is so important, Will, is because I'm sure we've had the experience as salespeople where we said all the right things that we were taught about in training. And somehow the customer still decides not to buy, even though we said everything that we think the customer needed to hear. And the reason the customer didn't buy wasn't because of the quality of our selling presentation. It was because of the quality of their buying decision. In other words, you have the salesperson's selling performance, and that's not enough. It has to be matched with a good buying performance. And a lot of times, salespeople get their selling performance down, but they lack the skills to be able to elevate the quality of their customer's decision process. And that's what I want to talk about today, because salespeople uh, typically aren't learning those skills in traditional sales training. It's all about the selling process. So would it be fair to align this up to say that Sellers are taught how, well, hopefully, sellers are taught how to sell succinctly. They're taught a selling process, but perhaps buyers aren't taught, unless they're full on procurement officers, perhaps they're not taught a buying process. Would that be fair? They're taught the buying process. However, salespeople have a unique set of knowledge when it comes to making decisions about their particular product. Okay. A, a buyer can't know what a salesperson is going to say to them. The buyer has to be receptive. And if the buyer is distracted or um, thinking about what they learned in training and trying to put the salesperson's words into what they heard in training, that's not going to serve the salesperson. The salesperson needs to say things in a way that the customer the buyer is going to be most receptive to hearing. And that might mean putting aside preconceived notions they might have told that buyer in their purchasing training. And that's a skill set for salespeople to learn how to communicate to buyers that way. So you get their, their full attention undistracted from previous training they might have that would prejudice them against salespeople. Okay, so let's dive into if we if it's possible to split the two. I'm not sure if it is. If there's a set of skills and then if there's a process. Because it outside listening into this, it almost seems like what you're suggesting there, and, and this is gonna sound crazy and ridiculous, and I'm making it slightly crazy and ridiculous purposefully, but it sounds like we're almost saying we need to hypnotize the buyer 
to make them put down the damn phone, listen to their presentation, and then give us the opportunity to add a ton of value to them. And whether that is actually hypnotizing them or not, is that is that the, the first step of this? It's related, but actually it's the opposite of what you're saying, because the point I'm making is that buyers may be hypnotized themselves simply because of all the demands that are putting being put on them by other things while they're talking to the salesperson they may be thinking about something else and they're in a bit of a trance and what i'm saying is how can salespeople detrance the buyers and have the buyers be aware of what's taking place in the here and now between the interaction between salesperson and customer now in order to do this, salespeople need to be much more customer aware. And unfortunately, salespeople are too salesperson aware. Let me give you an example. Every sales presentation involves two conversations. And salespeople are only trained on one out of those two. The first conversation is between salesperson and customer. And that's what salespeople are always focused on. The point I'm making is that there's a second conversation, and this is the buying conversation going on between the customer's ears, and it's called decision-making. And a, a salesperson with a good product that meets the customer needs would, would hope that the internal decision process of that customer is going to be in, in sync, but it rarely is, maybe because – that customer is hypnotized, like you said, Will. It, maybe they're distracted. Maybe they don't know their own goals. Maybe they're confused. A confused customer is not going to buy. So salespeople need to be more aware of the customer's decision performance than of their salesperson's own selling performance. That's the point I'm making, is decision performance and coaching for better decision performance is a unique set of skills that salespeople need to be able to be able to use as opposed to just their selling skills. What does it mean for a buyer to be in sync with um how we're presenting to them because i want to then if we get the perfect buyer the perfect person who's in sync we can perhaps work backwards from there and then get to the rest of the customers that <laughs> if we're dealing with day to day so what does it look like if we walk into a room we're doing some presentation and to use your words jeffrey the buyer is totally in sync yeah well it's a process and the first thing is the salesperson needs to make sure that they are on the buyer's side and being on the buyer's side means that the salesperson conveys their commitment is to help the customer make the best decision because that's why the customer wants to talk to a salesperson. A salesperson, if you're a customer and you're talking to a salesperson, why would you want to spend time with them? You want to talk to the salesperson because you feel that salesperson is going to help you make a better decision. Well, that's also what the salesperson wants. So the salesperson and the customer need to be on the same page to help customers make the best decision. When you get that, then you're on the same team. So the first thing about being in sync between salespeople and customers is to, for customers to know that the salesperson is dedicated to help them make the highest quality decision. That way, you're not going to get the customer withholding information. You're going to have that kind of trust that you need. The second thing is to have the customer be able to convey their beliefs, their values, their priorities, their uh, objections, their goals. This is important because salespeople need to be able to modify their sales presentation to integrate with the customer's priorities and the customer's beliefs and values. And you're only going to get this when the customer is in sync with the salesperson by conveying what's going on for the customer in, in real time. 
if the customer is not in sync, it's typically not because of a problem with the salesperson. It's typically because the customer lacks awareness because they're being pulled in different directions and really haven't thought about their goal and perhaps have a self-limiting belief or perhaps don't trust their ability to make a good decision. These are all things that interfere with the decision-making process that have nothing to do with the salesperson. And salespeople need to be able to apply the skills to help customers through that process and get more in sync with the salesperson to be able to make the best decision. So is the first step here then, Jeffrey, to to almost diagnose the customer and see what their personal roadblocks or professional roadblocks would be to making progress with even just a conversation. Because if we're on their side, right, we're, we're trying to have a conversation, see if everything lines up and see if the deal makes sense on both sides. So we're, we're going to remove all the kind of manipulation conversation out of here for a second and, and assume that everyone is on the right page. They're all doing B2B sales for the right reasons. They all want to build long-term relationships. So we'll, we'll set the scene as that. So it's the first step to diagnose and get in the mind of the buyer and, and really suss out what's going on in there. Uh, that's the second step. The first step is to develop a coaching relationship, which is different than a selling relationship. And as I just mentioned, the coaching relationship involves letting the customer know that the salesperson's commitment is for the quality of the customer's decision, to help the customer make the best decision. Once that's, once that's agreed upon and how, once how that's- does, How do we do that, Jeffrey? How does that look? Because um, it's one thing to say, hey, uh, John, I'd love to just sit down with you for 10 minutes and see if I can really just help you and add a, a ton of value. It's another thing for the customer to actually take that on board and not think that I'm, I'm just there to bullshit John and stuff my, shove my pitch down his throat after 10 minutes of coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, to hear about the decision process up to now is a good way of doing it. Perhaps the customer is talking about a few different products in, say, the financial services industry. And the salesperson may say, well, how did you come about even deciding that you need a retirement plan in the first place? What was that process like? And actually backing the customer up a step back to see, well, just how did you arrive at the decision to buy a retirement plan? And now we're looking at, is my retirement plan better than my competitor's retirement plan? But wait a minute, let's make sure that you need one at all. Can you tell me about that decision? Okay, now the salesperson's showing concern. And by the way, the salesperson typically has a lot more experience with customers making decisions about their product than, than the customer has. I mean, a financial services salesperson is going to have a lot more experience with customers that make decisions about retirement plans and what instances did the decision turn out well. And what instance did the decision turn out not well? It's a wealth of experience that the salesperson has to share with the customer as well as as long as the customer's receptive to hearing it. So being on the same team is very important. And there's a number of ways to do that. And uh, it's just a matter of normal, natural communication, I think, because customers are going to do what they can in order to make the best decision. Decision-making is a natural process, okay? The gift of choice and free will have been uniquely endowed to the human species. So unless there's some interference, some lack of trust, the customer is gonna do the research and seek out the resources they need to feel best about the decision they're making. And one of those resources is a salesperson, as long as they have the sense that the salesperson isn't giving them false information. Well, we won't go down the rabbit hole of free will. We'll save that for another conversation, yeah, uh, okay. Jeffrey. But yeah. say now we've lined ourselves up as an uh, industry expert, advisor, whatever cliche term we want to use, uh, which is kind of rampant across the sales industry right now as it goes through this change. 
we, we we've set ourselves up in the mind of the, the potential customer as we are genuinely there to help them. We've backtracked, as you said, which was awesome. We've found out what their initial input is for the decision uh, process uh, to start is. We've gone through that with them. What do we do then? Considering perhaps it's been a friendly conversation so far and we can yeah. sense there's a little bit of trust there. Okay. Well, what we want to do is see what the customer's need is, basically. The important thing, though, is to be aware of whether the customer is in touch with their need. It, when the customer is talking about the decision, do they want to buy a product? Do they not want to buy a product? It's the, the yes or no is not as important as how are they arriving? What's the process that they're arriving at as a decision? Is it a high quality decision? Is it an informed decision? Uh, and you know, perhaps it is, but if it's not, there's a system that you could put in place to sort of diagnose where the interference to good decision-making might come from. And there's three potential places. The first place is self-doubt. And when you're coaching somebody, whether it's an athlete or whether it's an actor or whether it's a customer, self-doubt is going to hurt the quality of the decision they're making or help hurt the quality of any performance. In the case of decision-making, self-doubt could lead to a customer perhaps making a inappropriately conservative decision. And so what the salesperson would want to do is help the customer feel more confident about the decision, their ability to make a good decision. A lot of salespeople make the mistake of prioritizing external confidence, which is the customer's confidence in the salesperson, and internal confidence, which is the customer's self-confidence in their decision ability, comes first because the customer's not going to trust the salesperson without first trusting themselves to decide if they can trust that salesperson. And this involves that second conversation I'm talking about, the conversation between the customer's ears called decision making. The salesperson has to see if the customer has some self-doubts and deal with that or you just won't get the sale no matter how great your sales presentation was. This is awesome. We'll stop in this, Jeffrey, just for a second before we move on to the other two uh, kind of mental blocks, which I think you've alluded to here, because you used your words very carefully and I'm jotting them down here and you, you kind of dove into it a little bit, but I don't want to gloss over that of, uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but we are, we're not overselling the product or giving extended warranties or guarantees. It's not on our side. We're trying to get in the head of the buyer and maybe they are not confident, they're shy, there's, there's something holding them back. So how do, we, how do we coach them without calling in Tony Robbins to get them excited, to get them um, to build up their confidence in themselves to, as you said, not make that conservative decision? Because I've been there when uh, I, I literally had this conversation a few days ago of a brand wanted to sponsor the show for a year. They came in all guns blazing and now they want to do it for a month as a, as a tester. But if they do it for a year, they're going to save a ton of money. So, uh, so I'll, I'll take this on board myself. How do I get that individual who, as a person, is a, perhaps a bit, how to describe him, is a bit beta, is a bit timid, is a quote-unquote introvert, but I know he's very good at what he does. Um, but I, I'd love to just be able to light that fire in him and get him to go, yes, let's do it. Let's Because you know the deal is better for him if, if he does that because he's going to he'll probably save about 15 grand if he... Uh, if he does commit to that kind of 12 months. Okay. Well, the first thing to do though is to get a little bit more information about why he thinks it would be better to just do it for a month. Uh, it might not be self doubt. Okay. It might, he might've made a conservative buying decision, but who knows it might've been an appropriate buying decision because we don't know his financial situation as well. Uh, you know, perhaps, there's other commitments he has financially for other marketing things that he's already been committed to. We don't know that, but that's something to ask, I'd say, is to get a broader picture 
of what his situation is because you know, perhaps you could modify your offer to work around the other commitments he has. The important thing though, Will, is how clear he is on his commitments. Is he just saying, let me stick my foot in the water because he's really making a wise decision? Or is he doing that because he doesn't know any better and he doesn't really want to look into more details whether the – and therefore lose money in the annual membership, the annual sponsorship? We have to, we have to pair that out. That's well, what a good I'll, I'll give you another layer of context here because this is a, an interesting example as, as it's yeah. appropriate. and Hopefully the audience likes seeing some of the behind the scenes here. The CEO of the company, um, and I don't want to give too much away because I know they listen to the show, but the CEO of the company is all for it, pushing this dude to, to go for the 12 months. So yeah, maybe as you say this, I'm processing it myself. Maybe he has another plan for some of that budget six months down the line. Perhaps his priorities don't align up rightly or wrongly with the CEOs. Interesting, because I've got a good relationship with the CEO as well. Maybe he feels like I've tried to go around him and go to the big boss man, which I haven't. Um, we, we just get on. So we, I was passed down the food yeah. chain to make that decision. So yeah, th there's definitely food for thought there. Yeah, you're being a great coach right now. You're thinking about the alternatives. You're, you're not making the dis the assumption that he made the wrong decision, uh, but you're putting your preferences aside in order to really look at the world through his eyes and see what would be in, in his best interest. And if he's not making a good, de good decision, what's the source of interference? But like I'm, I'm saying, there's there are three potential sources of interference. It could be self-doubt. We covered that. The second one is it could be a self-limiting belief. And a self-limiting belief eliminates choices. When I talk to salespeople, they usually talk about, I want the customer with the most decision-making ability. Okay, they're talking about the external choice, the most choices. And so I want to look at somebody who's at the highest of the company org chart, the executive VP. So they have high external choice. And when you sit down with that person, you find out they have low internal choice. Inside, they feel very restricted and disempowered on the inside because they have a self-limiting belief. They could say something like, yeah, that sounds like a great product and normally I'd really want it, but the board wants my head on a platter. So any decision I make right now, they're going to scrutinize and try to hold it against me. And I got shareholders to answer to. And I have regulators to answer to. So I can't make any decisions at all. Why don't you talk to my admin assistant? Maybe she'll want it. Okay. Uh, they have low internal choice. They have self-limiting belief. In this case, it was the belief that the board is after them. So perhaps your buyer has a self-limiting belief. Uh, it could be that uh, the CEO is – maybe trying to set me up for something <laughs> and or uh, I made two purchasing decisions that he criticized already. So if I make one more mistake, uh, I could be in real trouble or whatever the self-limiting belief may be that are limiting his ability to really have a lot of choices that, that limits his range of options for doing things in his company's best interest. And are we looking for a conscious belief that we we ask a question and we get a reply of, I think the CEO is after me. He's, he wants, he's waiting for me to make a bad decision. He wants me out of here. Or because that could also be a subconscious belief of the person just is just paralyzed, isn't making decisions because they feel or or they've made a couple of bad decisions and criticized and they don't want to be criticized again, which may be part of their role, but then because they're not conscious of this, they're paralyzed from it. So are we going as deep in this as trying to suss out people's unconscious conditionings and beliefs, or are we staying to that higher level? If you're skilled enough to be able to go to subconscious beliefs that are limiting a person's 
options for choosing, options for purchasing, that's awesome. Uh, that would be great to be able to do that and then be able to point that out or be able to surface that in a way that the customer could see that there are viable alternatives to thinking that way. Well, that, that was the next question there, Jeffrey, of how do we go about pointing that out? Because that could be a weird conversation if the person in front of us doesn't realize that they've been psychoanalyzed by the salesperson who is just trying to sell them accounting s software as a service. Well, again, I, I keep coming back to this. You're, you're not psychoanalyzing something, somebody, you're, you're helping them make the best decision. Okay. And if, if you see that the decision making is limited because of a belief that they really weren't aware of, some hidden assumption that they were making about maybe salespeople in this category or um, spending an amount of money that's beyond what they're typically comfortable spending, you know, whatever the subliminal belief might be. You're there to increase their choices, choice whether it's going to be purchasing your product or the choice whether it's better to purchase somebody else's product. But, but you're there to help elevate the quality of, of their decision. I think you've touched on something here very specifically, which is perhaps they have conscious, unconscious, regardless of, of, of this for this point, but they might have beliefs about salespeople, right? If you've got salesperson on your card, if you've got business development, whatever it is, we all know the digital of words for salespeople. I've been an account manager, territory manager, uh, ex ex something executive, definitely wasn't an executive role, but they put that in there just to try and uh, kind of elevate the posi position that I was in. Is there a way to go about framing up the conversation? And we're going to take five steps back here to take a few forward. Is there a way to set up the conversation at the very beginning to put us in a different bucket than the quote unquote salesperson or the used car salesperson that they're associating with us because we've got that in our title. Well, a lot of it goes back to what I said originally, Will, which is that salespeople and customers cannot be on the same team if they have different goals. And so that's why it's so important for the salesperson to make it clear their goal is the quality of the customer's decision. Because if the salesperson's goal is different, which is my goal is for the customer to buy my product, is not the same thing as the customer's goal, which is to make the best decision. You're working, you're not a team, okay? You're working at odds with each other. You have two different goals. And this is why, in general, the selling profession has this negative stigma because salespeople and customers don't typically work as a team toward the same goal. And that's why I keep stressing our commitment is to the quality of the customer's decision. If you want to transition from the selling relationship to the coaching relationship, you need to do that. And when you want to transition is when you're saying all the right things and there's something in the customer's decision process, which is interfering with them making a high quality decision. You want to transition from a selling relationship to a coaching relationship to be able to influence that internal conversation going on inside the customer. But you can only do that by invitation. <laughs> okay. The, the customer's inner decision process is a silent process. You can't hear the gears turning inside your customer's head. So the only way that you could influence it is by permission. And you get that permission by being on their team. That makes total sense. So Jeffrey, we've got self-doubt. We've got limiting beliefs. What's the third thing that we need to mentally tick off when we're coaching someone through decisions? Well, I save the most important for last. The, the last one is self-awareness. I call it internal clarity. And basically, it's the customer's knowledge of what they need. And salespeople don't value this as much. When I typically toss to salespeople about the customer's awareness, they're thinking of the customer's product awareness. Does the customer like my 
product? Does the customer like me? Does the customer know what my product, why it's better than the previous model? Uh, why it's better than my competitors? That's external awareness. Internal awareness would be the customer's self-awareness. Does the customer know what they need? Is the customer in, in touch with their feelings the product would give them? Does the, is the customer confused? Is the customer distracted? If a customer is not in touch with their need, then how will they know your product benefits will satisfy that need? <laughs> so self-confidence comes first. The, the customer has to know what they want before they could tell that your product is going to give it to them. And a lot of customers don't have that self-awareness because they're so distracted. This is getting back to your original question about B2B customers. Are, are they really doing their jobs well? Are they really e equipped to make good decisions? And this self-awareness is what that question primarily hinges upon. If the customer knows what they need, then they're much more able to seek out the kinds of products in the marketplace that will satisfy the need. But a lot of times customers are too distracted, confused, conflicted, and lack the self-awareness to be able to find the solutions. And this is one of the things a salesperson with coaching skills can provide to a customer is a greater level of self-awareness, getting in touch with the needs. So Jeffrey, I'm sat in front of a potential customer. How do I uncover, if we take away the verbal element of some of this, because some people won't admit that they don't really know what's going on. They won't admit that they're not in control of everything. And they won't admit that they're just about to get sacked if they make one more terrible buying decision. How do I suss out where they are, whether they have true domain knowledge on this and whether they do really, whether they've uncovered their need, especially if I can see it because I'm doing these deals all the time. I'm helping these people all the time. How do I yeah. know if, if they really uh, understand this on a deep level? Well, you could just ask a few simple questions like, how do you know that you need this? Or if my product works out, how will you know? What will you see? Yeah, I, years ago I was doing a, a sales interview for a, a, a company and I, I, as for, for me being a salesperson at this company and the company happened to use distributors to get all the products out to the customers. So I, I would be talking to the distributors, not necessarily directly to the customers themselves. And I scratched my head during the interview and I said, well, how would you know that I'm doing my job as a salesperson since all you have is the sales data of the distributors? How, how will you know that I'm being successful? And they had no answer for me. And I didn't take the job because there, there was no awareness. Okay. And so this is just one of many questions that a salesperson can ask a customer to see if the customer has the level of awareness to really make a good decision and to get the customer in touch with the factors they need to determine in order to make a good decision. For example, if I was a financial services salesperson and I was talking to a customer and instead of talking about my retirement plan, maybe first I would ask them, well, how much money do you need to be comfortable in retirement? And perhaps they really hadn't thought about that. And perhaps I have to get out a spreadsheet and say, okay, well, what are your expenses going to be? And get the customer to have that internal clarity, how much they need before I decide which product to present to them. It's as simple as that. But customers need self-awareness. They need internal clarity in order to make the best decisions. And as as salespeople with so much more experience 
with customers buying our product, we're very well positioned to be able to help customers with this. Jeffrey, that is, I never thought about it like that, but that's a very profound question to ask. And I kind of, you, you can reword it, uh, you can reword it for us in a second, but essentially if, if, if this all worked out, what would be the outcome? And it, it gives us then ammunition to reverse engineer their outcomes versus us telling them what we think the potential outcomes could be. This is crazy powerful. Great, crazy powerful. But I, I want to say, though, you need all three C's. You need confidence, clarity, and choice. So maybe I ask the customer that question, and maybe the customer gets clear that the customer really does need my product, but do not feel empowered to be able to make the decision. Then, because they lacked internal choice, they had a self-limiting belief. So even though the clarity was there, because the choice isn't there, they feel disempowered, they can't buy the product, even though they want it badly, and even though they know it would be great for them, I still didn't get the sale. So confidence, clarity, and choice, you need all three. I've got one final question for you, and then we'll wrap things okay. up here. Is this a part of the process, in the sales process, that happens once right at the top, we get everything cleared out, and then we go, okay, now we just move on to X, Y, Z, one, two, three, and we close the deal and everything's happy? Or is this something that crops up all the time and we can end up right at the end of the sale uncovering something new and we need to be constantly conscious of it? Is it a, is it a binary element of the sales process or is this something that we need to be aware of the whole way through? Yeah, that's a really great question, Bill. It's kind of all over the place, I think, because it has to do with the salesperson's quality of prospecting. If the salesperson is able to really qualify their prospects to the point where they know they're talking to most customers that really do need this product, then it might not come up that much. If the salesperson is talking to a group of customers where it still hasn't really been qualified to the point where the salesperson knows if the product is appropriate for the customer or not, then you're going to need to apply more coaching skills early on, I feel. Uh, so so it, it could be either way, but uh, you know, sophisticated customers are usually a lot more internally clear and and you don't have to apply these skills as much, but I'd say any salesperson would want to have these tools in their toolbox to be able to transition from a selling relationship to a coaching relationship, because we all have had experiences when we said, we know we said all the right things. And for some reason, the customer still isn't buying. The answer to that problem is within the customer and, the, and that internal conversation going on between their ears. We need to be able to influence that on the internal level. Jeff, it makes total sense to me. And with that, I want you to tell us a little bit about the book. And then I know you've got some online training, a course as well. You tell us both about them because this is very unique, the way you look at this. And it's similar kind of concepts, but reframed from a different perspective. And I think there's a lot of value, especially from the book. I've read it uh, for the audience. So tell us about the book, the online training, and then anything else you want to share with us as well. Okay. Well, I'm very excited about my online course. This is exciting because it actually helps impart the skills, the actual coaching skills necessary to be able to address a customer. So in my online course, which takes about five weeks if a person does 15 minutes a day, you're able to practice and create your own questions, kind of like what you asked me, Will, when it came to uh, what if you have a customer in this situation, what would you do? We actually use instances that salespeople taking the course have encountered and then use it to build a strategy, a, a customer coaching strategy to be able to improve the quality of the customer's conversation. Then I also have a book on the subject. Now, the book is great because it's the first selling book that's written in the form of a fiction novel. The reason why I did this is because I wanted salespeople to see how to learn from conversation. So the principles in the book that we've been talking about on today's podcast 
emerge from dialogues between the customers rather than having me just teach the principles. And this is important because coaches have to be the learners, not the teachers. Because the decision process is performance and coaches are on the sidelines. So we need to be able to observe and listen to the customers' beliefs and values and opinions and priorities and challenges in order to know how to respond as coaches. So this is why I wrote the book in the form of a story. And it has actual examples in the book of things salespeople can say that would help customers be better decision makers. And where can we find them, Jeffrey? On my website. Both the book and the online course can be purchased on the website at www.sellingtothepoint.com. Perfect. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org. Jeffrey, you're a legend. I enjoyed this conversation, mate. And I want to thank you again for joining us on the Sales and Podcast. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. This is a great opportunity.